Um, I will now hand you over to Clara Araka Kasami, President of ICOMOS UK and Chair of the Intangible Culture Heritage Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, we've got uh, 79 uh, participants already in the room and we had 130 odd registered to, to attend today. So it was it has been a very good response. Um, and when we looked at the participants and we had a very good representative sample of the whole country, uh, different parts of the uh, country, plus the three devolved nations are represented as well. I hope they're there in the audience. Um, and um, the, the, there is the academic sector, heritage sector, research sector, uh, and the intangible cultural communities, the heritage communities also represented in this. So I'm so pleased and very uh, appreciative of you attending this meeting this morning. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm, as Joe already mentioned, I have been the chair of this committee and the founder of this committee, Intangible Cultural Heritage Committee, for a long time. But before that, let's let's look at, uh, you know, why we are here. We welcome UK government's intention to ratify. We've worked at it for 12 years. The Intangible Cultural Heritage Committee has worked tirelessly. Uh, try, you know, you, you can read it in the program. I'm not going to repeat it because we have, you know, we have limited time. I don't want to uh, waste my time repeating what is already in the program. So we've done a huge amount of work. And so therefore we are you know, absolutely pleased. Um, who we are, Wickermos UK, again, you have in the program who we are, but I will just add a couple of things. Uh, you know, we have 11 to 12,000 membership across the world. Uh, that shows the kind of experiences that come together to create doctrines and charters and policies that that is internationally recognized. And also we have 30 international scientific committees from across, you know, people from across the world are part of that. And they help to produce these doctrinal texts. We in, in, in the UK are the national arm of international, the international ECOMOS. And we too have eight committees, uh, not 30, but eight. Uh, we mirror the structure in Paris, the international structure. Um, so let me move to the next slide. Uh, um, I'm managing this. Um, can... Hmm. I want to make this slide smaller. Doesn't matter. Uh, today's program is about giving you information. Phil Foxwood, who's the government representative who's here, who's been working um, on intangible cultural heritage. And the questions I've been asked to Phil is, when is ratification day? What happens the day after ratification? I think it's a legitimate question, curiosity. Uh, I'm sure you will um, you know, lay out that, uh, what the, the plan is and what the government is going to do. Um, Maria Nystrom will give the Swedish model to us, what it is, because when we had the last round table, when we explored models of ratification, we invited Four countries and Sweden was one of the countries to present and her colleague Annika Nordstrom was here at that time and 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 Maria was present and so she's come back to give us another reflection what happened how did they get, go about it uh, and what are the lessons that we could learn from them uh, it's a model that it's a concept that uh, we have borrowed well the government has borrowed I felt it was important to bring in the local government perspective forever. I mean, ever since I've worked in the cultural sector for about 30 years, local government have played a key role and an arts council, I must say, going back several decades, um, arts council has played a key role as well in encouraging intangible culture. They didn't call it that, but they did fund intangible cultural heritage in local authorities uh, and regional authorities and, and community heritage. That was how it was presented. So we have Zaritha Brown from Camden and 
Jody Davy from Cornwall um, Council. The purpose of this meeting is to consult ICMOS uh, members as well as other people we've worked, including uh, practicing communities over the last 12 years. We wanted you to inform us you know, what you thought of this, these proposals so that we can also represent your views in our response. On the other hand, we also wanted to help you to give you the information so that you can make informed response to the DCMS when you are making your own personal responses. The meeting today is focusing on the communities rather than, you know, top down. We are looking at bottom up. Um, it We will be, the breakout groups in particular, would be looking at the proposals from the community points of view, the impact of, of, the, of those proposals on the community. So it is the cornerstone of the 2003 um, convention. I thought I would lay out a few key issues that would help you to think through some of the discussion, to during the discussion, some of the responses you're going to give, and also help the discussion to, to take account of these things, which I feel are important. Um, first and foremost, it was announced on the 23rd of December. So, and, and you know, two, we lost two weeks because of Christmas and New Year. And then, we had therefore we have six weeks to present this response so you know it almost presupposes that there is sufficient understanding out there but in my view there isn't there is a lot of work to be done the tiny practicing groups who have a huge amount of information and feedback to give how are we going to consult? How is the government going to consult them? What facilities will be in place? I mean, okay, this is the first stage of consultation. Are there more consultation processes uh, in place or being arranged? Now, we also need to look at, um, you know, how we build the capacity. We often go to um, big cultural agency, international agency like UNESCO, which has a lot of capacity building experts. They have a pool. And in my view, um, having worked internationally, there isn't sufficiently, that pool is not sufficiently diverse enough to meet, meet the UK's need, which is super diverse um, communities. And we, could help UNESCO, in effect, to, to bring about the change in, you know, in diversifying that pool. We need to develop our own homegrown capacity builders. Uh, recruiting from the practicing community, there are loads of people in the practicing community who are very capable of doing this capacity building. We don't have to entirely rely on big, huge international cultural agency. We need to develop our own model. Um, so that's why it is important. I did raise this with uh, Tim Curtis, who was the, the previous secretary, the general or sec director of, of um, UNESCO Intangible Cultural Secretariat. And, um, you know, it's not new. This is something that I've raised already. Defining communities. There's a big thing about defining communities. There are theses galore and there are research galore all over the place. Loads of documents uh, ha held in, in various institutions. And I think what was important is communities uh, always have a passive role in this. It's taken over by researchers and academics defining communities. So the communities agency is taken away from them. They need to define who they are, and they can, they have done so. I mean, they know who they are. They, they, their ancestors are practicing many of these um, expressions for years, centuries, and we need to listen to them um, unless there is exclusive and discriminatory practices where we need to intervene and decide how the community is constituted and where it's going wrong. And if somebody says you have to have as it, for a joke, someone said you have to have a blood test before you join that group. Th those are some of the things we need to look out for. Don't impose community experts on communities uh, or research findings or discourses, uh, which they have not been part of. Often we tend to um, 
use community experts who have, you know, trained elsewhere or did a piece of research onto communities, tell them how to do it and what to do. Class, race and caste issues are still alive, well and kicking, and they're raised by practicing communities. And the impact on, their, on the community's survival, their settings, environment, and the ICH they embody, uh, especially when culture is used as a regeneration tool, or when there are uh, climate change impacts where the community has ba been badly flooded or you know various other uh, adverse uh, impacts that result from climate change. Inclusion, this is a big issue for us. We are a super, super diverse community. It, we are multiracial, multicultural, multilingual. And we need to accept that. And often there is a tendency to bypass that, you know, not acknowledge it. This trend is going to continue with, uh, you know, what's and all I've said, uh, and it'll become more of a norm in Britain in the future. And communities have, you know, very much navigated that diversity better than the heritage sector or experts uh, leading to, we have lots of uh, fusions of cultures in this country now. You know, to, to, if you look at, you know, what we ate in the 50s and 60s or 70s and look at the cuisine we have today, the amount of fusion, just one example. And we also look at carnival, who takes part in those festivals, uh, many mela, you know, festivals, Chinese festival, we have, you know, all kinds of festivals that increasingly going to be um, fused and we can call it evolved or should we create a separate category for fusion of cultures? What does inclusion mean? Is it cultural diversity, rights-based approach, participative practices, lived experience, equality, which is it? I mean, there is a, you know, an array of terms that we use. How will it be implemented? And more importantly, how would we measure the impact? And, and I've said here, don't transplant diversity ideas and models from other parts of the world. You know, people who have done a PhD in Mali, you know, we said, you know, that is cultural. I know all about cultural diversity. That's the right model. Or from Iran or from, uh, you know, Asia, China, India, there is this tendency, let's, let's, let oh, that, that's happening there, we shall import it. And it is controlled by experts, it's not the communities, and don't impose those kinds of um, external models. We have a model, we need to nurture it, we need to develop it, and it will be our own model. And we can share good practices always across the world. That's what we are doing all, all the time in Ecomos. But we also need to be mindful we don't just transplant a model from another part of the world because somebody has done a PhD or some research in it. Will there be policies to cover the nine protected groups? You know, the, the Equality Act has in the protected characteristics. You know, we haven't talked about the other, other categories. Um, and also inclusion must be a core theme that runs through all um, implementation of the ratification and post-ratification. Funding is a major issue and it's critical to safeguarding. Quite a lot of um, uh, intangible cultural expressions don't get uh, get stifled or become dormant or die out because there is not no acknowledgement uh, that these communities need funding to enable them to continue that practice and safeguard it. Um, and, and the grant criteria, you know, we all know it's not an easy process. Often we have to morph ourselves to meet the criteria, uh, and co you know it contributes to mismatch and ticking boxes and frustration for everyone, um, and it hampers safeguarding. You know, you you, you you then you can completely turn the expression into something it is not in order to fit the grant processes or the grant criteria. Does the government have a ring fence spot for this? You know, I'm, I'm sure Phil would um, say something about that. Will there be new streams, easy to access streams? And what about research funding bodies like the Arts Humanities Research Council? Would they be funding uh, communities? Up to now, they are more focused on academics and researchers. And will they be funding communities to undertake their own research? And that's, you know, how would they create that capacity? 
uh, decision making structures, if it's applied properly, the bottom up approach, communities should be co um, uh, chairs and co, co you know, drivers of the structures processes that is being proposed in the proposal. How will they play an equitable role in the structure that are set out and who decides who is appointed? And will the community represent on these structures be remunerated? Often we expect communities to play a voluntary role. And local governments are quite key and they are nearer the communities. And I've already said, you know, they have funded previously. How are they going to be involved in this new structures and processes? And connecting the intangible with the intangible, there has been this separation you know, we have focus on the tangible much more than the intangible, but they are interconnected and increasingly there's the recognition of this. There are moves to bring the two key um, convention, the 1972 World Heritage Convention and the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention closer so that they can work together. And marriage, uh, memory and heritage institutions like museums, they are busy trying. Our own pilot project showed this, very busy and very hardworking and trying to get the connection uh, working. They need capacity building. They need help how to um, get the intangible values out of the, pro the objects they hold and the artifacts and documents they hold. And ICH is a you know, cross-cutting issues and we in ECOMOS we feel that like climate change intangible culture is a cross-cutting issues that runs through all our conservation practice. Finally my thanks to all of you here present um, there's 80 there are 86 of you in the audience uh, and the speakers and facilities facilitators for today um, my, my thanks to them for making time and to be here and take part. And ICOMOS UK's Intangible Cultural Heritage Committee members, I cannot thank them enough. They've persevered, they've worked with me, and special thanks to Joe Buchanan and Janice Chaddy, uh, who have helped to coordinate this event for today. Um, and the ICH communities have in informed our work throughout our trajectory for the of the last 12 years. Heritage Agency, museums, they have provided support and in-kind support and sometimes financial support. UNESCO Paris, um, Tim Curtis in particular, I'd like to thank him. He's worked with me and the, the committee um, for many years now. Uh, and Phil Foxwood, when he came along in 2021, just before our roundtable meeting, we had a very interesting meeting. And and I must say, Phil has helped to drive this forward. And Nigel Huddleston, the MP, the minister at that time, you know, when I wrote to DCMS with all our proposals, who sent us a very positive response, uh, saying that he will get his officers to um, review. And here we are. It has been reviewed and we are moving towards ratification. Um, Work for me? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we could move on to the next slide right away, please. So I work, um, as Clara said, as a senior advisor at the Institute for Language and Folklore in Sweden. Uh, meaning that I'm responsible for the coordination and implementation of this convention in Sweden. Um, and we're a government authority um, that works with uh, language, names, um, dialects, um, culture and cultural heritage in Sweden. And um, I will talk today about the, the first step after, before and after implementing the 2003 convention in Sweden and how we built this structure and the working methods um, and a little bit of how it has evolved since 2011. The so next slide, please. Um, so uh, in Sweden, from the very beginning, there was a lot of hesitation uh, before ratifying the convention. 
Um, so in 2009, the first assignment from the government was given to a number of um, government authorities, uh, really to uh, explore how and if we were to implement the 2003 convention. And uh, we at ISOF were one of the authorities. Um, we saw a lot of risk uh, with the, the implementation of the convention. Um, one was very much con um, connected to the listing of the ICH elements, which would risk, um, as we've talked about a bit uh, already, uh, a hierarchy of um, heritage elements saying that one is better than the other. And it could also risk, um, could say, freezing them in a, in a certain time or um, uh, in a certain character and not letting them evolve. Uh, we also saw a lot of challenges with coordinating all of the national actors, um, both within the uh, kind of um, professional sectors, sector among communities, NGOs, um, how we would be able to define and recognize all of the very diverse form of, of ICH and how we can um, really take into consideration and respect the rights of practitioners while implementing this sort of official structure. Um, however, we did recommend <laughs> ratification in the end, uh, given that this sort of convention really can uh, bring a lot of um, attention and really shed light on the importance of ICH for communities, for practitioners. And we could also see some positive, positive effects um, with international and regional collaboration and basically just learning more about this very diverse field. The next slide, please. So, uh, in 2011, um, Sweden ratified the convention and ISOF got the uh, assignment to really build this structure and to become the uh, um, become the um, official authority on uh, the 2003 convention. So these were some of the main parts points of departure uh, when creating this structure. And the first one was to really build on the existing structures, the existing networks of uh, heritage actors, of NGOs, uh, of uh, communities and groups, in order to document um, an inventory of living heritage, and also to create new networks and collaborations. And of course, list instead of list, um, to really work with um, outreach, dissemination of knowledge, building an inventory instead of focusing on the international list, together with civil society um, and NGOs in the field. Uh, we also uh, saw a lot of um, potential for Nordic uh, collaboration. We have a strong collaboration um, by tradition in the Nordic countries and with all the Nordic countries having ratified the convention, we saw this as a huge opportunity, opportunity as well. And then also, of course, to be flexible in the implementation of the convention, be allowing uh, for change uh, in the methods and the structures that you have uh, built when you need um, um, new actors and so on uh, appear. So next slide, please. So uh, the basic structure in Sweden is that ISOF is the responsible authority for coordinating the uh, convention. Next slide, please. But we don't do this alone, of course. Um, one very important part of creating this structure was to create five expert nodes. 
these are uh, centered around some of the thematic areas um, that are defined within the convention. Uh, I could take the next slide. Uh, we'll see a bit more. Um, here you can see the authorities that coordinate the expert nodes. So we have the National Handicraft Council. They are responsible for crop. The Nordic Museum, together with us at ISAF, we're responsible for uh, oral traditions, um, uh, traditions, celebrations, and so on. We have the National Collections of Music, Theatre, and Dance, who are responsible for well, music performances, dance, etc. We have the National Heritage Board, who are responsible for ICH connected with nature and um, the built environment. And then we have the Swedish Sami Parliament, uh, who are responsible for Sami uh, intangible heritage. Next slide, please. So what is an expert node then? It's not only the responsible authority, but a huge network of different actors. As you can see here, there are, these consist of uh, heritage institutions, researchers, knowledge centers, um, uh, education, practitioners, NGOs, communities, experts, and so on. Um, so these nodes today, they have a lot of functions. They were particularly important uh, in the beginning uh, when implementing the common, com convention in order to uh, start building the inventory. So before launching the inventory to the public, the, um, the discussion really centered on uh, how do you make people understand what, what, what an intangible heritage is and what we are supposed to do with an inventory. What are they supposed to suggest to be added to the inventory? So um, it was really needed to have a few kind of representative, representative examples on the inventory uh, when it was launched. So that was one of the first tasks that was given to the expert node. So next slide, please. So we started with uh, creating the categories. So you can see some of these are taken from the um, convention, uh, but we've also added food traditions and methodological examples as we felt that food traditions was a very important um, category um, that kind of falls within a lot of the other categories. And also the methodological examples that has always been a priority for Sweden um, to Kind of disseminate good practices and good methods of safeguarding. Um, so next slide, please. But um, some of the first elements um, that were uh, added to the inventory, as I said, these were uh, selected by the expert nodes, or they were developed by the expert nodes. So they really had to consider elements that would kind of show a diversity of different expressions, different groups of communities and practice, practitioners um, that exist in Sweden today. And uh, like in this slide, this is from our inventory, you can see um, a Jewish celebration, a Jewish tradition alongside with the Lucia tradition, which is a very big common Christmas tradition in Sweden, and the love locks uh, on bridges, which you can see all over the world, basically, and in Sweden as well. Can I have the next slide, please? And these are also some of the early examples where you um, were aware also of adding more contemporary um, examples of ICH, such as uh, live action role playing, uh, very much everyday uh, heritage, uh, such as these 
clapping, chanting and singing games. So you really got this kind of uh, uh, diversity of different expressions. Um, and you can see that this, this took a while. These were all added um, uh, in 2013. That was when the um, uh, inventory was launched to the public. The next slide. And this is uh, what an element on our inventory can look like. Uh, you have a um, kind of an introductory text uh, here about um, fab food culture and agricultural practice in Sweden. Um, we have a kind of geographical um, location of the uh, element. Next slide, please. And then we have these different headings uh, where you have a description of the um, definition, say, of the element. You have its history and you have the safeguarding and passing on knowledge. Next slide, please. Um, and I think this is one of the most important parts of the elements and one that has to be updated most regularly, where you really um, can tell people what is happening today with this element, with this heritage, what are people doing, who are doing this, in what way are they safeguarding and passing on the knowledge uh, of these heritages. Um, and um, the uh, Swedish inventory uh, is being updated regularly. Every other year we um, um, well, we contact the uh, communities uh, behind every element. We also um, uh, have the expert nodes who help us to look at the elements and see if something uh, needs to be removed or added to the element. Next slide, please. Um, in the early stages of um, working with the inventory, you could, it was completely open. You could um, um, really um, submit a, a suggestion for the uh, inventory at any time. But uh, during the last year, we have tried doing uh, an annual open call for the inventory uh, in order to kind of have a more, um, more planned workflow and um, um, a more transparent process of how we're working with these suggestions. And we have a few criteria. There's not a lot of them. It should be a living heritage that is practiced in Sweden today. Um, it cannot include any illegal or discriminatory, discriminatory practices. And it needs to be submitted or supported by communities and practitioners. Um, and um, this year, I think we had in total 30 suggestions for new elements on the, uh, on the inventory. And um, we think in the end, there will be about 17 uh, that will be inscribed on the inventory. And really, the, um, when we say no to an element, it's usually because it's not suggested by a community member, maybe a local politician, it might be just someone who's not really familiar with the element, uh, or it's not enough information for us to be able to develop this into this uh, kind of article that you could see uh, previously. Um, but if you can kind of um, describe how and why this is a cultural heritage, most suggestions really make it to the inventory. Um, so next slide, please. Just a little bit about what we are doing besides keeping this inventory, because we are working a lot with uh, outreach. We are trying to reach more groups, uh, individuals, communities, um, to kind of raise awareness about the uh, importance of ICH and safeguarding. We work on creating both national and regional networks, both 
professional and um, uh, community-based networks and various types of capacity building activities. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Because in um, 2018, we did something that we said we, we wouldn't do. Um, and uh, slightly before this, in 2016-17, um, the national inventory had gained, um, well, quite a quite a lot of uh, elements, and there was um, there was a rising interest among practitioners and communities for the international list. And uh, this ended up with the uh, Land of Legends um, program, um, actually making a proposal for the Register of Good Safeguarding Practices. And the Swedish government decided that this was the time to start with these um, international nominations. Um, so with this um, first, nomination or this first selection to the register, um, we kind of realized that this brought a lot of attention to the convention and the uh, national inventory and ICH in general, really. Um, so uh, I uh, got the um, um, got the assignment to uh, prepare a process of how we were to handle nominations for the um, international list. Next slide, please. So at the moment, uh, we are doing open calls for the representative list and the Register of Good Safeguarding Practices every other year with a few criteria or rather priorities. Um, we are focusing on good safeguarding practices, uh, nominations that somehow promote sustainable development, and multinational nominations. And um, you can basically um, give a suggestion uh, for a nomination, and then these suggestions are um, evaluated by a expert committee with people from different thematic areas um, of the convention to then decide if any of the suggestions should be um, a nomination in the end, or if they could also decide to not uh, recommend any of the suggestions for nomination. Um, next slide, please. Just very quickly, we have had uh, one um, element, uh, a multinational nomination of the Nordic clinker boat tradition um, inscribed on the representative list. And then last year we had another um, element inscribed on the register of good safeguarding practices, the Nickelharpa network. Um, next slide, please. And we are also at the moment working with two nominations. This one has been submitted um, to the Secretariat last year, the Summer Farming Fabwood Tradition, uh, together with Norway. Next slide, please. And we have just started working now with the dip net fishing in Tornadalen together with Finland. And um, just something on these um, international nominations. Um, what we have seen is that these nominations, they do bring a lot of attention to the convention. And there is uh, a lot of interest by communities to develop these uh, nominations. However, it does require a lot of work, a lot of resources. Um, we want the communities uh, and the practitioners themselves to develop these nominations as the, you could say that the nomination process in itself is a sort of a safeguarding factor, as it entails defining the uh, elements, reaching out to practitioners, having workshops, having long discussions, 
before you finally sort of fill in the official form to the NEPCO and submit your nomination. Um, but what we also see is that there are also a lot of expectations of what um, an inscription would entail. And in reality, it doesn't entail anything unless you put in a lot of work after having been listed. If you do put in a lot of work, this can mean international networks, new collaborations, a renewed interest in your heritage or tradition. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will get a lot of resources or funding, etc. Um, so it does run risk of a bit of a disappointment. Uh, next slide, please. So have we abandoned this list, not list uh, approach? Um, I would not say that we have abandoned it um, completely. We are constantly evaluating uh, these processes. Um, there are a lot of things to take into consideration about the um, nominations and the listings. Um, you could say, for example, the uh, geographical imbalance that you can see on the list. And as I said previously, that listing doesn't really provide a quick fix for safeguarding an element. Um, community involvement and um, a big community involvement in these nominations is really key to have them kind of serve the purpose of safeguarding the element and raising awareness of uh, ICH in general. Um, so those are kind of really our both negative and positive experiences of um, listing. But as I said, we might not continue with these nominations in the future. We are currently evaluating the situation. Next slide, please. So some just some final challenges uh, because we're really never <laughs> you're really never finished uh, developing these structures and these methods. They're always changing. Um, something that we've uh, people already talked a lot about today is uh, to really reflect diversity uh, in your methods, in your structures, in your inventory. Uh, really be able to reflect the multicultural society, um, reflect contemporary expressions of ICH. This is not something that we have achieved um, at this point, but it's something that we're um, always working to develop more. And also to reach new audiences. In particular, we are trying to reach more young people children, youth, and young adults, which are challenging um, to reach out to at the moment. Um, I think I've got a final slide. So you've got my email here. I'm going to stop my presentation, but if you have any more questions, uh, you could also reach me by email. Uh, so Well, Maras, Mitten Dap, Pabonan, Jadi Ovi, Dwarf Consul Kerno, Hagith Thessalvi, Hembrunkius, and Yeth Kinuik, and Jadi from Cornwall Council, and I'm the Cornish language lead. And the Cornish language is a Britonic Celtic language, which is similar to Welsh and Breton, and linked to the Celtic language family, which includes Irish, Scottish, uh, Gaelic, and Manx. And so for context in this setting, I think it's important also to say that I'm an ICH practitioner myself. So I'm an active member of these grassroots communities that we're talking about. I've grown up doing folk dance and playing traditional music, and particularly that of Cornwall. And I'm a trustee of Lewenda, which is a charity and cultural development organisation and one of many groups in Cornwall working to protect and promote Cornwall's ICH. So I think this ratification process provides a really exciting opportunity, and this has come up already, to kind of reflect on the full extent of the UK's vibrant diversity and the many layers within it. Um, and picking up on what Clara was saying earlier about how we make this process uh, bespoke to all of us here in the UK.
so with this in mind, I'm going to give a short description of Cornwall's uh, status and then what Cornwall's ICH communities are telling us they need and the support that the council is offering. So uh, next slide, please, Joe. Thank you. Oh, it's gone a bit squiffy there, but you get the you get the idea. So in 2002, the UK government recognised the Cornish language under the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages and a Cornish language office, including the Cornish language lead role, was set up. And in 2014, the government recognised the Cornish as a national minority under the European Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. So um, thank you, Ian, for introducing that for me actually earlier already. So this affords the Cornish the same status as, for example, the Scots, the Welsh and the Irish. And uh, being recognised as a min national minority means the Cornish have the right to express, preserve, share and develop their distinct identity and culture. And in 2015, the UK government devolved responsibility for obligations under these treaties to Cornwall Council. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we've got a, an infographic. You can see the relationship between the Council of Europe, the UK government and Cornwall Council. And the Cornish Language Office sits now within the culture team, which is part of the neighbourhoods department. So alongside teams like libraries, leisure and registration. Um, and the team report to the National Minority Working Group, which was set up by Cornwall Council. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what is the relevance of all of these treaties for Cornwall's uh, ICH? Well, much of what went into particularly the case for national minority status uh, for the Cornish was Cornwall's ICH, whether that's its language, dialect, uh, to medieval outdoor theatre traditions, Cornish wrestling, Pilot gig racing, customs like the Halston Ferry Dance, St Piran's Day, Stargazy Pies, Pasties, uh, all of that. Um, but underpinning this, the kind of Celtic and global context ICH is given in Cornwall uh, due to the Cornish language. So whether that's inclusion in the Celtic Media Festival, uh, other international Celtic festivals, Celtic song competitions, whether the language and other ICH practices are showcased side by side, um, or on a global stage where we're able to share experience and best practice with Indigenous and other minority cultures and ICH practitioners across the world. Uh, so in Cornwall there are terms for ICH practices which are either bilingual or entirely in Cornish, uh, songs in Cornish, these elements of ICH are all baked together. And so um, picking up on what Phil was saying earlier around defining difference and making links and how all this is reflected in the inventory process, um, it's extraordinarily complex but this is an exciting moment to see how we, we capture all of that. I'm just going to pause here briefly um, and flag that there can sometimes be, I think, concerns raised that the development of the Cornish language or asserting of distinctiveness is all about kind of inward looking, parochial, or kind of separatist agenda. Um, I tip that on its head. I say what we're looking at here is about how we're opening up, embracing the UK's diversity in all its forms and connecting communities across the world. Um, and I've included a, a quote here I like from the submission that went to the UK government, which says that inclusion in the framework convention will serve to further enhance the United Kingdom's reputation as a country that celebrates and supports the diversity of its habitant inhabitants. I think that's really important to say, and I think it comes back to my earlier comment. Um, this process of collating the inventory feels like a really exciting one to capture that kind of rich and multi-layered diversity of, of the UK. Um, so this is about celebrating diversity and difference, but I also think shared values and particularly with ICH, that sense of community, of curiosity and indeed that connection back to planet uh, with so many ICH practices being based around our relationship with nature and the changing seasons, of course, connect us all. Um, we know the UK are relatively late to the table with this, but I think it means, you know, it puts us in a positive position where there are loads of great examples and we've just heard them from Maria about how other countries have successfully captured this uh, cultural diversity in the process. And of course, all of this is being discussed and it's a fascinating topic of conversation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, fast forwarding to 2021 and in the wake of the pandemic, but also other factors like the cost of living crisis, um, a group of ICH organisations approached Cornwall Councils so that included Loenda, the Gorseth, the Federation of Old Cornwall Societies, Cornwall Heritage Trust and Feast um, to support a mapping exercise of Cornwall's ICH as a health check to see what was happening and where. Uh, what was going well, what was frustrating the ambitions of ICH practitioners, whether that's individuals, groups, or organisations, and really just start the building blocks for a more strategic approach to safeguarding and developing intangible cultural heritage practices. Um, and what was very pleasing to see here, as you can see from this pie, shot, 
pie chart was just how evenly spread um, the reach was to, to ICH practitioners across the diff different disciplines. Um, so it really underlined for me the effectiveness of the community organisations who commissioned this research being trusted by grassroots communities and having really good reach into those communities. I will say here, though, that there were barriers. I think we picked up on this earlier around supporting those communities through terminology, intangible cultural heritage. I think many of those probably wouldn't identify with that or understand what that meant, see themselves within it. Um, so there are important things to take away here um, through this process now of, of ratifying um, how we engage with those communities and the language that we use. Um, and although we didn't know it at the time, actually, this has turned out to be an excellent precursor for Core Multi, the ratification process that we're now building on. Um, and in a way, you know, listening to what Maria was saying earlier, we've, we've almost created our own expert node here in Cornwall. We didn't know that's what it was called. <laughs> and there we go. We've got one. Um, and also, again, reflecting on what Maria was saying about kind of meaningful impacts for those communities around what is essentially just a list of things, um, you know, how it's not which is not going to release any more funding or resources we know. Um, but I think there are positive happen things happening. For example, um, the mapping exercise that we created did bring, you know, for the first time, some of these intangible cultural heritage organisations together in Cornwall to look at things strategically together. That was important and that was a catalyst of this uh, process. Um, and I think, you know, and, and also that that opportunity to think and look at that full diversity of the UK. So, OK, we're not getting funding or resource, but there's some important issues being raised, I think, through the process. It's important to take away. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is really the, the juicy, interesting bit. What were the communities telling us? What were the results of the mapping exercise? Um, so here are the areas of research that we picked up on and the recommendations that were made against. Uh, so communities, um, intangible cultural heritage by its definition exists through people and by being you know, animated by those communities. And a lot of feedback expressed concern about the impact of things like the housing crisis, which we feel particularly keenly in Cornwall as fracturing those communities um, that ICH relies on for transmission. And there were recommendations that communities worst impacted by the housing crisis could become a strategic uh, priority for support. And the younger generation were also highlighted as generally missing demographic in ICH practice, whether that was being driven away from Cornwall because of lack of affordability or just lack of general ownership of this heritage and resources or activities being in a format that didn't feel relevant to them. Uh, marketing and digital skills perhaps not completely unrelated so therefore there was a lack of marketing and digital skills with current ICH practitioners in Cornwall uh, marketing and digital training particularly areas like social media design tools like Canva how to make video content understanding audiences were all highlighted as key areas where support was needed um, like digital resource was flagged as a real area of potential growth and particularly with international interest in Cornwall's heritage, either those Celtic connections, global indigenous language connections or Cornwall's mining diaspora connections in places like the US and Australia. Um, this is an area that did pick up actually during COVID uh, with various talks and events moving online and attracting a new international audience and that's something that's come out as a key element that could really be built on. Uh, networks, there was a sense that uh, the organic ICH networks in Cornwall were, were patchy, some working well, but interconnectedness in general being weak. Um, and that's an observation really rather than a criticism, say, with much of the ICH sector in voluntary roles, there's currently very little capacity for this strategic overview. Um, and because ICH networks are clunky, the knock-on effect is therefore it's difficult to partner with wider sectors, for example, the creative industries, wider heritage or business sectors. Um, there was a sense there's a strong will among people to engage with Cornwall's ICH, but fractured networks meant that the way was unclear. Uh, so to support to improve networks was therefore a, a recommendation from this resource of research, sorry. Um, pathways and resources. Um, so once those networks were improved and the profile of ICH was raised, the question was, uh, what are the pathways in like? What is the welcome like? How is the sector welcoming new and diverse audiences? And are there resources and information available to support new audiences in the sector itself with developing this? Um, of course, leading on to finally funding, um, we know much of these recommendations require supports, but where does that come from and how is it sustained? Uh, so next slide, please. Thanks, Joe. 
So I've just picked out here a few of the example quotes from the mapping exercise, um, things like, if you don't have good, strong communities, you won't have good, strong cultural heritage. Um, I like this one. We're being launched into an area we've got no expertise in. Uh, there's a lot of great work going on, but there's not enough collaboration or a big umbrella that brings it all together. So here's some individual responses that highlight the kind of overall mood of the, the research results. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so where does uh, Cornwall Council fit into this? Um, well, in terms of funding, the FEAST programme already exists, which offers small and accessible grants to grassroots community organisations. And many of these have been ICH groups, um, practitioners, festival organisers. And Cornwall Council has also just signed a new devolution deal, which was approved in November of last year, so very recently, uh, which sees half a million pounds of funding come into Cornish distinctiveness, including the Cornish language and other areas of intangible cultural heritage. So this is um, nicely timed in some ways, nicely aligned with this announcement around the ratification process. Um, and so much of the priority for spending looks to address some of the recommendations that's coming out of the ICH mapping exercise, uh, which was commissioned. So this is including um, priority areas around promoting those pathways, um, offering groups funding to test ways of bringing new audiences to their activities and supporting opportunities for better networking among ICH groups and wider communities. Uh, capacity building, so for example, consultancy support offers strategic reviews for ICH organisations so they can more clearly articulate their aims. That's helping to open up opportunities to draw in partners and investment. And importantly, research and evaluation. So we'll be carrying out extensive evaluation of how the funded projects have developed, looking at what best practice is, what can be shared or pitfalls to avoid um, and offering recommendations for ongoing strategic priorities. So it's safe to say that this initial mapping exercise has really just scratched the surface. There's, there's loads more to be done to really understand the needs of these grassroots communities so we can ensure that we're not just safeguarding this heritage, but also encouraging it to thrive and, um, again, promoting this really rich and diverse cultural tapestry that we have in the UK. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the end of the, the presentation. So, Miraz, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to try and um, mine's quite short um, and I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious that I'm the last presenter before we go into uh, break. So um, hopefully I'll be able to get through this with time for questions at the end. So as you've heard, I'm Sarita Brown. I'm head of culture at the London Borough of Camden. Um, I'm sure many of you are all familiar with the Camden. It's an inner London borough in North London. Um, and our um, the culture service sits within um, regeneration, economy and investment. Thank you. Ne next slide, please. So just um, some, some, some highlights around Camden. So we have a very diverse and vibrant um, borough. Over 140 languages, um, different dialects are spoken. 274,000 residents um, reside within the borough. Um, Camden is a borough which I guess is known um, is, is known for things like Camden Lock. It is known for things of like, you know, some of our big cultural venues um, and individuals as well. But actually, when you scratch beyond the surface, Camden also is a borough that is known for its subculture. It's also known for its, you know, we, we, the re rebelliousness um, and doing things different. It's also also known as a borough which is very multicultural. It's a borough which a lot of people came to, not just post um 1948 immigration but way before that as well um it has a thriving um cultural and heritage sector you know we have some of the organizations that that other um, boroughs refer to as um as a crown crown jewel organizations like the british library british museum um but despite that many of our residents who have access to this don't actually feel that they have access to it and don't feel that it really reflects um their their culture or their heritage. The other thing I will say about Camden as well is that we are in the process of becoming a borough of sanctuary. And actually over the years, we have seen our communities change a lot. Um, and we have a lot of um, refugee communities as well as migrant communities as well. Next, next slide, please. 
and so sorry, just the image before on that on the slide before was of Little Amal. Some of you may be familiar with Little Amal. Little Amal came to um, Camden last last year um, as part of an interfaith celebration, but it wasn't just interfaith. It was also about communities as well and communities coming out and storytelling and celebrating this moment of of Amal coming into the borough. What we did is with Amal, not only did Amal go into some of our bigger cultural organisations, but also went into our estates and into our resident communities as well. Sorry, next slide. So some of the barriers um, for communities in accessing inter intangible um, cultural heritage, which we know is happening, um, the practice is happening. So I'd say the first thing is language, the use of clunky language. So actually, what do we mean by this? And I'm referring back to a project that I did when I was at another authority before coming to, to Camden. Um, I was at the London Borough of Brent, and one of the projects that we looked at was around the borough's um, musical heritage, in particular reggae music, which is a, has a whole cultural movement in itself, but wasn't something that as a borough we were recognising and really celebrating and capturing. And um, in talking to the community and first working with the community to co-produce that and celebrate that, the first thing we did was break down what we meant by heritage um, and not even actually use the term heritage and um, or archiving. We, we came up with new terminology, which the community felt much more comfortable with using and being able to embrace and move forward. So for us, the first thing is around how, what do we actually mean and how do we use um, how do we use some of these phrases, which we know as a sector, but actually don't really land or mean much to our communities. Um, the two other big things, resource, you know, so funding, so knowledge of where funding is and how to unlock it and space. So in, I've been at Camden for um, around 18 months and these are the conversations which are constantly coming up with our communities around how they might want to practice their um, um, ICH, but being able to kind of be signed pointed to be able to um, access resources in order to support them doing that. Next slide, please. So just some of the things that we're doing in Camden to empower um, communities in terms of funding. Um, so within um, the culture service, the events team sits within that and we administer a culture festival grant annually. This has been um, signed off by cabinet a number of years ago and it's something that we protect within our within our budgets. So um, last year as an example we funded up to 57 organisations anywhere in the region of £500 up to £2,000 to put on activities mainly in the outdoors but to put on activities which celebrate um, you know different parts of the borough and different cultures within within the borough the image that you can see here is an image of day of the dead it's one of our biggest festivals within um camden but it is a, com a, a wholly community funded um uh festival as the event service as well, what we do is we provide event management support to our organisation. So I've just said Day of the Dead is one of our biggest, but we have smaller organisations as well who need support with how to put an event on in the public realm. And that could be anything from supporting with their event management plan. It could be anything from waiving the fees of road closure and waiving some of the other associated costs that that that, um, that you have with doing events in the public realm and the team provide i guess sort of wraparound support to our communities so that they're able to realize the potential and realize a vision of the event and activity they want to do um, and then space as well so what we try to do is provide access to free, free space through our venues or working with partners to access free space within our partner venues and by partners I mean cultural partners so this could be any of our bigger organizations through to some of our VCS organizations as well as an example of space the town um, Camden Town Hall was recently refurbished and reopened last year we have a community room within that space um, within the hall called the Claudia Jones room and what we've committed to do is to offer that free or highly discounted for our communities to be able to use it to for, for their for their activities next slide please the other thing that we're doing is um, in terms of events and activities 
but curating these with community partners. So the two images that you'll see in the on the deck here. So there's one image to the uh, which is my top left, is of a uh, Caribbean front room, and we we did this last year to celebrate the 75th art anniversary of. Windrush and we work with an organization called Camden Black British History Group to curate a Caribbean front room and the reason why we did that was a the power of that front room and that in terms of a con intangible um, heritage within the Caribbean community who arrived in the UK post 48 but how we document that and bring this these con bring um, and celebrate this history heritage through conversation and activity um, the partner that we work with, Camden Black British History Group, the council also supported them with space for a year, providing space within um, a shop front so that this organisation could have a base where they could practice um, this heritage. But we also, um, for the first time, did a Windrush um, celebration. It's the first time we did it in a public space. I'm not calling it a festival because it wasn't um, a large scale festival in the way you might see other London boroughs doing it. But um, in the same way, it was a festival for up to 2000 people who attended during the day. Um, and we are working with a community. We've pulled together a community, uh, a community led group to support us with developing that for this year. And then the other image that you can see in the top right was of South Asian Heritage Month. It's the first time the local authority did a public facing um, um, South Asian Heritage Month event. But again, we worked in collaboration with our partners in the Regents um, Park Estate to program and curate that event. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing around supporting our communities is we um, this just this month have um, gone out to recruitment for um, advisors predominantly from our resident community we're hoping to help us kind of shape cultural programming going forward but also to tell us and tell us where we need to support them to be able to practice um intangible um cultural heritage next slide please um, at the heart of these, so these are things that the culture service are doing, but these also link to bigger strategy or policy areas within the local authority. So We Make Camden is a council's vision for the borough. It was developed um, post-pandemic following conversations with residents and partners and community leaders, and it sets out what the council co um, collectively wants to do. And as part of that, as the council's made available, these We Make Camden kits, which provides funding to support the Camden citizens to and community groups to start projects or initiatives and again these are images from um, events that were funded um, through the through the um, events cultural festival grants part but just gives you a, um, an idea of sort of the breadth of activities that are being funded and then I think my final slide um, next slide please talks about diversifying the public realm so um, you will all be familiar with um, the um, the events of 2020, not just the pandemic, but also the Black Lives Matter movement. And then you'll all be familiar with the work that um, local authorities undertook around looking at the diversity in the public realm. So Camden's public realm, um, whilst it is rich, doesn't reflect with um, the communities and, so, and, and the diverse communities and residents and their role in developing um, the borough. So um, in the lead up from 20, 2020, there was a cross party um, members group who looked at the diversity in the public realm um, of Camden and from that um, committed to undertake um, developing a strategy. So an officer group formed out of that and the strategy for diversity in the public realm was created and published in 2022. And it aims to ensure that all of our um, um, residents and communities have access to um, celebrate different diversity in our in in the public realm and that is either through programming or that is through things like putting up blue plaques so we put up a blue plaque up um last week for the reverend dr martin luther king it's the first blue plaque i believe in the uk um and we worked in partnership with nubian jack community trust and also um the bloomsbury central baptist church um and also other community groups in order to make this happen so I'm going to leave it there. Um, these are just a few things that we're doing in Camden to start really kind of um, celebrating and documenting um, intangible um, 
cultural heritage.